Hi everyone and welcome to this um, first workshop from uh, us, the PALP team uh, for BitCraze, hosted by BitCraze actually. And we are very happy of this uh, opportunity. I'm Daniele Palossi, postdoc at the Dallemolle Institute for Artificial Intelligence in South of Switzerland in Dugano and uh, postdoc at ETH Zurich. The talk, uh, this first talk will introduce you to the uh, PALP um, paradigm and the overall project uh, to go more into details uh, uh, later on with the other talks of uh, today. But first then uh, moving into the technical details and the overview, let me introduce the team that uh, today is uh, with me for this uh, workshop. We have uh, Lorenzo, PhD student from University of Bologna, focusing on artificial intelligence and deep learning. Then we have Hanna from ETH Zurich, also PhD student, expert in PCB design and system like uh, nano, nano drone and small uh, robotic platform. And also Vlad from ETH Zurich, um, that is a PhD student as well in, in, in ETH uh, uh, Zurich. Vlad focus uh, mostly on localization and algorithm for uh, estimation on small robots. Then last but not least, we have also Manuele Rusci, that is a postdoc at the University of Bologna and a senior engineer in Green Waves uh, technology. Good, once we have this uh, uh, set, let's uh, continue with a bit of a uh, uh, overview of um, this uh, team and the various members. So basically between uh, the various university and uh, Green Waves, uh, we are uh, located, as you can see, in the center of Europe, a bit uh, in uh, Switzerland, like uh, ETH Zurich and the University of Lugano in Italy, and close by to uh, Switzerland, uh, the Green Waves technology that is uh, a quite recent uh, startup, a uh, fabless semiconductor startup that is actually uh, optimizing and uh, industrializing one of these uh, pulp uh, system on chip uh, to make it uh, uh, commercial and available also on uh, your AI deck. Uh, last piece of information, if you like this kind of research activity, if you like the topic and you are thinking about uh, a PhD, we are actually uh, always looking for good PhD candidates. So check out uh, the calls that are available on websites uh, of all uh, universities. The agenda for today, it's uh, uh, composed in total of uh, uh, two hours uh, uh, workshop, starting from this introduction, from the uh, parallel ultra low power overview by me. Then Manuele will bring us into the details of uh, one specific uh, pulp based system on chip, the GAP8 uh, produced by Green Waves Technology. Hanna will continue with an overview on the uh, printed board, the AI deck, um, and the software backgrounds uh, basics um, to start working uh, with the system on chip. We will have a short break, uh, and then we will continue with the second part that is uh, basically uh, hands-on sessions split among four different uh, topics. The first two covered by Hanna will be the basic programming on, of the system on chip and some introduction to image manipulation and uh, camera acquisition of uh, images. Then Vlad will continue with the overview how to integrate uh, the intelligence that you can develop on the AI deck together with the um, CrazyFly basic uh, platform based on the STM32 microcontroller. The last part that will be very interesting will be the video streaming part by Lorenzo that uh, will uh, uh, introduce you the Wi-Fi streaming, another possibility made available on the AI deck, together with some JPEG compression to show a bit of a use case and complete application. Good, let's start from this PALP. Maybe you know, maybe you don't, but PALP stands for Parallel Ultra Low Power, and it is a quite uh, um, aged project uh, started uh, more than seven years ago as a collaboration between the University of Bologna and the ATH uh, of Zurich, led by the uh, vision of uh, Professor Luca Benini. Collaborating uh, within the PALP project, uh, the, we have a quite big team spread, uh, as you saw, all around uh, Europe, but not only, uh, with more than 60 people. And actually today, I think we are even more 
and um, we focus on uh, various aspects uh, not all of us are working on pulp not always uh, but we cover the full spectrum from the hardware design of the system on chip uh, up to the uh, support uh, software layer operating system compilers up to the very end of the final application this project started with the goal of uh, uh, enable uh, a new kind of computing uh, platform for our research uh, and uh, with uh, many, many use cases uh, such as autonomous uh, uh, nano drones able to fly by themselves with their own uh, intelligence. And uh, the goal is to, uh, was uh, and is to share this uh, hardware design with other groups, other teams in Europe and in the rest of the world. One key aspect of these uh, uh, parallel ultra low power paradigm is uh, the energy efficiency to push to the very maximum of uh, IoT computing system and uh, of course um, to keep it uh, with an open source hardware approach um, to share and improve uh, together with collaborators and uh, interested uh, parties. So what we uh, started with uh, was uh, the idea of having no dependency from uh, any commercial IP been quite flexible and agile in our progress. And therefore we started with the open risk extraction set uh, architecture. And around the mid 2016, as you can see in this uh, overview of our roadmap, we switched to the risk five uh, extraction set architecture. Um, then to put things in perspective, how this uh, system is composed in a very general and high level uh, view, we started, as I said, working on the basic course. We developed uh, uh, multiple of them as a research project, student project, and uh, we reached the point that uh, we would need more to make this uh, system actually usable and uh, uh, field proofed. And for that, we start working on peripheral, interconnects, and why not also accelerators for some specific uh, task. At that point, we have all the basic ingredients to start combining uh, these uh, various cores and peripherals and accelerators into different platforms. You can see on the, on the left part of this picture, the um, single core platform, uh, meaning um, um, system that are quite um, suitable for IoT domain, where you have, for example, very uh, low uh, intensity computation, but you want to uh, rely only on battery that should last for years, for example. Then if you start combining more of these uh, uh, cores, a risk five based core into the same uh, domain, you get what we call the cluster. That is the combination of multiple cores that might be uh, like in the case we will see today, uh, same instances of the same core. And we get this uh, uh, multi-core uh, system on chip that is actually what you have on your uh, AI deck that you can use with your crazy fly. And last but not least, we have the uh, extreme limit of uh, combining multiple cluster together, so still um, having a great improvement in energy efficiency also for use case uh, such as high performance computing. So we span the entire spectrum of uh, um, different uh, power envelope uh, in different application domains. And this, as I said, this uh, multi-core uh, paradigm or a template is the one we will refer uh, today. Manuele will give us uh, very insightful details in a short while. Just to put things in perspective, how many chips uh, we, did we taped out? Uh, well, quite a lot, more than 30 in uh, these um, seven years. And you can see here represented as a planet uh, with different uh, uh, technology in the production process. Uh, for example, the bottom line of planets is um, 22 nanometer. You see uh, the various uh, years where we uh, worked on that specific uh, chip. Most of them are research projects, but a few of them are also student projects and industrial collaboration as well. Good. Among all those uh, very nice uh, planets, uh, we are actually interested in one specific uh, uh, of them, the GAP8, the GAP8 system on chip that, as I said, is based on the um, PULP project, but then has uh, brought to the next level to, uh, with a very uh, important uh, optimization by green waves uh, technology. And as you can see in this picture, this system on chip, it is uh, quite small. 
if you think about the die, the, the, the inside the, the package, uh, it is only three square millimeter. And uh, you can really uh, see a bit of a vision when you have a, such a powerful system on chip in a, such a small form factor and power envelope, it looks like a very good candidate for a small robot to increase uh, the intelligence on board. And this is, uh, you would, as you will see in a short while, is what we try to do. Who's using uh, Pulp? Well, we have uh, many industrial users that we are aware of, uh, such as, of course, Green Waves Technology, but not only. You can see here uh, a bit of an uh, overview, as well as a collaboration with the research institutions and the university all around the world. So to go more into detail, how does it come this system on chip available on your uh, nano drone, on your uh, crazy fly? Among many uh, subjects of interest in our research effort, there was also the heterogeneous model. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, you can think about the heterogeneous model as the combination you have on your PC, for example, of a powerful GPU and a um, very efficient uh, um, core processing uh, uh, CPU. So when you have this heterogeneity on the system, what you want to do is to get the best by both devices or by all the devices you have. For example, in this case, for us, the heterogeneous model uh, was explored at the ultra low power scale where we want to combine uh, ultra low power uh, MCU with a, a still a low power accelerator and in this case, uh, the idea was to have um, the MCU in charge of um, being able to interact with as many sensors as possible, like a camera, uh, like you have on your, on your AI deck, but also microphones, IMUs, and so on, and in charge of um, control-oriented tasks. Then what you get from having an accelerator available is a very um, powerful computational unit to accelerate a very uh, heavy algorithms or a workload, such as uh, uh, visual navigation, when you have, uh, uh, where you have to process uh, images uh, coming from the camera. And for us, uh, this accelerator was um, one of these um, system on chip, the uh, multi-core paradigm of the PALP project, for example. And uh, we, uh, we used them, this uh, RISC-V processor that I want to, to, to stress once again, those are uh, general purpose cores. So are not specific for one type of application. They are quite useful in many, many use cases. What we did next was the development of uh, what we call the Pulp Shield. That basically was an additional board for our favorite drone, the uh, Crazy Fly from BitCraze. We developed this um, uh, PCB and we put uh, on that the GAP-8 system on chip with additional uh, external memory, such as uh, DRAM and flash memory, and also an ultra low power grayscale camera, the HiMAX uh, camera. All the, this uh, design and our effort has been made uh, open source. You can uh, find it on Git, all the designs for uh, uh, replicating or even better improving our system on chip as um, BitCraze and uh, um, Greenwaves technology did. They uh, took the design and they improved that uh, and uh, they made this uh, uh, possible to, to be available to, for all of you with the AI deck. In uh, one uh, specific detail that uh, uh, is different between our first prototype Pulp Shield and the AI deck is the availability on the uh, PCB of an additional Wi-Fi module that is uh, quite useful, for example, for image streaming. Good. Now that you have a bit of uh, history in mind, a bit of overview of uh, how we uh, reached this uh, AI deck, uh, you can see here the um, high level overview of today's workshop. What you're going to need is a crazy fly uh, that, as you know, has an STM32 microcontroller on that, and of course, an AI deck. These uh, uh, two um, devices uh, can then communicate. Uh, we will give you, of course, more detail with the UART uh, link. But having uh, the uh, Bluetooth uh, Nordic radio on the crazy fly, you can also communicate with your base station via Bluetooth or, as uh, I mentioned before, with the Wi-Fi NINA radio, uh, uh, again, to your uh, laptop or base station. 
The first hands-on covered by Hanna will focus then on the camera and the um, GAP8 basic programming. Then uh, Vlad will continue with hands-on three with the integration. Now that you have this uh, computation, additional computational unit uh, and you want to run uh, on that uh, maybe some uh, complex uh, uh, visual navigation uh, uh, algorithm, you want to make available this information, uh, this uh, very crucial information to the flight controller on the STM32. And therefore you need to integrate and communicate between, between the two systems. The last part, as I said, is the hands-on form with the, the uh, Wi-Fi streaming and the image manipulation by Lorenz. Last, as uh, uh, just to show you a bit of a potential behind uh, this uh, AI deck, even if it is not covering this very workshop, but we hope we can have another one in the near future more focusing on this aspect, is the uh, kind of application that you can think, that you can envision once you have this uh, system on chip on your drone. And in this example, there is the PALP dronet that was uh, one of our first um, complete uh, application, closed loop uh, running entirely, entirely on the drone. And in this case, the task was uh, uh, lane detection and obstacle avoidance with a convolutional neural network running uh, on the uh, general purpose cluster of uh, GAP8. We use the uh, pulp shield and actually you can find uh, online both um, publication and additional resources uh, such as uh, all the uh, source code available on Git and the video that shows you how the system uh, works. The last uh, uh, information about this pulp drone is that even if originally it was developed for the pulp shield, we are working for a, a new version that we call pulp drone v2 that will be actually compatible with your AI deck. So uh, ready to use, ready to be tested uh, in field. The last part of my presentation is uh, uh, just another example of uh, some very recent work we did and there was um, uh, another convolutional neural network running uh, on, the, um, on the AI deck, this, in this case. And the task that this neural network is uh, able to perform is the human pose estimation resulting in the drone being able to first calculate the pose of a subject and then to follow him uh, moving freely in the environment. Also, this work um, is available on archive if you're interested about the details and the paper and the source code and video will short come on GitHub and YouTube. Then at this point, uh, I hand here my introduction. I leave the stage to Manuele that will bring us into the details of the GAP8 system on chip. Hi everybody, my name is Manuele Rusci and I'm actually postdoc at the University of Bologna and I'm also a senior researcher at uh, Greenwest Technologies. So here in this talk of today, I will uh, introduce you GAP8 and I will try to give you an overview of the platform and the main features. While uh, the, you will see lots of details later on in the workshop and to the guys that will present after of me. So before of going into the details about GAP8, I would just like, I would like to, let's say, show a little bit of details about Greenwest Technologies, the company which, is, uh, which has been designing and uh, selling uh, the GAP8 platform. So uh, Greenwaves has been founded in November 2014 in Grenoble. And uh, later on, leveraging on the experience of the PAL project, uh, we started the design of the GAP8 platform, which reached the market uh, in the beginning of 2018. So either we launched the cheap GAP8 and lots of tools and development board to demonstrate the GAP8 feasibility. Then later on, thanks to the success of the GAP8 platform, we open new office, one in Bologna, where I am actually working, and one in Shanghai in China. The, the story uh, uh, went on, and uh, in the late uh, 2019, we uh, officially launched GAP9, the next uh, generation of our application processor, but also some other new exciting platform, uh, such, such as the AI deck, which includes the GAP8 platform. So thanks to all the successes of our platform, 
we are still growing as a company. Right, right now we are 51 employees, but growing pretty fast. So now let's move uh, into the details about the GAP8 uh, architecture, our application processor for the IoT ecosystem. As you can see in the picture, GAP8 is a microcontroller like platform, which at the core includes a RIX5 uh, core with a digital signal processing uh, uh, tailored instruction set. That means that the instruction set of the core are targeting uh, very intensive computational task and digital signal processing. Coupled with the core, we have a large on-chip memories, which is 512 kilobyte uh, in size, and uh, a lot of set of peripherals, which can be used to interface the platform, which are rich, a rich set of sensors, such as external memories or external sensors, such as the cameras, as you can find the AI there. In, moreover, to move data between the external devices and the internal on-chip memory, you can, leave, you can make use of our micro DMA, which, basic, which is an autonomous engine, which mm, plays the transfer between the external devices and the on-chip memories in the total background of the CPU computation. The main feature, however, of the GAP8 architecture is the multi-core cluster, which is uh, coupled next to the microcontroller light ar architecture. The cluster include eight RISC-V core, uh, hom an homogeneous architecture, and this multi-core cluster can be used for really compute intensive tasks, such as machine learning and digital signal processing. The cluster include a tightly coupled on chip memory, which feature a low latency access time, which means that all of the core can make use of this memory in order to do fast computation, but also a, a DMA to place the transfer between the uh, off-cluster L2 memory and the in-cluster L1 uh, memory, the TCDM. So basically, our recipe to enable fast processing and artificial intelligence at the very um, edge of the network basically rely on three main points. The first one is the parallel processing. So thanks to our multi-core cluster, we can be up to nine times faster than traditional single core MCU. And this kind of paradigm really target high parallelizable AI workload, which are really, uh, which can, uh, gain lots of benefits thanks to this architecture. Next, we, we really believe in flexibility. So um, it means that all the cores that are included within our architecture are general purpose core and are, uh, all programmable via software. So that means that the platform can be adapted to whatever algorithm you would like to implement on it. And last but not least, energy efficiency, because the full architecture and platform is optimized for low power. And uh, in our world, this means uh, around 100 milliwatt at around 200 megahertz of clock frequency uh, in at full load. So now, uh, just to give you an idea on how does it works, uh, here I provide an example of, uh, uh, let's say, traditional pipeline for digital signal processing. So you have your data, which comes from the sensor, and then uh, uh, as a designer, you may have designed a full pipeline which translate the data into some high level information. And the question here is that uh, after design the function, how can we deploy it on your gap based system? So first of all, uh, you can simply start by getting your, your gap based system, such as the IDEC. And the IDEC is actually including the gap platform such, plus a rich set of sensors such as cameras. Once you, you have built it, uh, you can program via software in order to get your data acquired into the into the chip so data get transferred into the chip memories then you may uh, turn on the cluster and then move the data inside the cluster for the computation in order to achieve all of this step and uh, 
accomplish your task, we as Greenways provide lots of tools and platform to uh, get fast prototyping and really effective design. The tools start from uh, the rich set of development boards, such as the Gapuino that uh, you can already find in our website, uh, get it and programming at this for as a first prototype. Then we have a large set of tools, starting from the uh, RIS-5 GCC compiler, plus a software simulator in order to uh, design and test your algorithm on your host PC without the need of a real hardware. So you can basically take the simulator and test your own algorithm into, um, to see the performance on the Gaplet platform. In addition to this, we have a full software stack, which includes uh, the real-time operating systems, plus a full reach of APIs, the PMCs libraries, which enable the programmer to make use of all the peripherals and features of the architecture. In, in the scope of this and so on, you can actually find all, all of these tools already included in the virtual machine that you can simply download from the website. So uh, the uh, virtual machine already includes our, 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 our tools, but you can also find them in our GitHub online. In addition to this, we have also other another set of tools which simplify the life of the programmer if they want to try uh, embedded machine learning application. So in, in particular, we have the gap out Tyler and the NN tool which facilitate the life if you want to play some neural network application on, on, on GAP. Yeah. Uh, related to this, uh, I just want to uh, in, um, point you to the NN menu, which is a GitHub repository, which includes uh, several examples, starting from more basic ones to more complex ones about neural network uh, application for the GAP8 <coughs> uh, platform. Among of them, you can have several camera-based applications such as body or face detection, and also some other uh, full-fledged then application for face ray identification and, and our occupancy management platform. If you want to know more about GAP8 and Greenways, I also leave you the pointers about our website that you can navigate and eventually write us if you want any information. Thank you for attending. Hi, so now it's uh, Hanna speaking, I'm PhD at DTH. As, uh, Daniela already introduced. Um, so I'll first give you a bit an overview about the printed circuit board of the AI deck and then shortly introduce the GAP8 SDK. So we'll start with a short recap of the history. So the whole idea of the pulp sheet was to bring intelligence to nano drones. So we started with only having a crazy fly. So this has an, two standard microcontrollers on it, an STM32 and then Nordic semiconductor chip for the radio communication. So what do we need to, to bring intelligence to the system? We need more um, information about our surroundings, the sensors, so a camera. And it has to be ultra low power because we are on a really restricted system. So. The camera we chose um, exists in a grayscale and the RGB packet and gives us QVGA resolution images. Then we need more processing power. So we want to process these images. Often image processing is with parallel, it can be parallelized nicely because they are matrix op uh, operations. So a pulp chip as introduced before is ideal for this. And then one QVGA grayscale image already takes up around 80 kilobytes. So we need more memory than we have in our restricted chip. So we need external 
memory. We have the hyperbus interface and the pulp chip for this. So we take a hyper memory flash and RAM chip. And what's also nice to have, of course, is Wi-Fi streaming. That was not in the or original pulp shield, but it's sure nice to, to be able to stream the images to the laptop. So you see where your drone is flying. So now we had all these components and uh, in the next slides, I'm going to show you how they were put together. So first again, history on the pulp shield, um, we put them together to a pluggable PCB. It weights around five grams, has the gap eight system on chip on top, has some RAM and flash, the camera, and there's an open source design that was then taken by Bitcrace and um, was put together to a commercial product. Um, it's a bit heavier, but it also features additionally some uh, Wi-Fi module. So you can stream the images as I said before. Um, the other components stay approximately the same. Good. So now I'll introduce the hardware of this AI deck a bit closer. Um, first, why should you know all these logical connections in detail? So if you are debugging, it's really nice to know which interface, but not only interface, also which voltage level you are expecting, such that you can snoop on the buses and see if something goes wrong. Also, you are flying a drone, so maybe you'll crash. So you, you, it's good if you know how to fix something, if something breaks, so you know how everything works. And also it's an open source design. So maybe you want to do your own deck and reuse part of this work. So then you really need the details. So first here you see a logical connections between the crazy fly with two UART buses going to the Nina Wi-Fi and the gap eight. Those are connected via SPI because SPI um, has a higher bandwidth than UART. So, and uh, Images go from gap eight to the Nina Wi-Fi, so you want to have a high bandwidth there. And you see also the HiMax camera connected to the gap eight. So those connections in a bit more detail. Is the first thing you need to know is that gap eight has multiple voltage domains. So it's not just all simply free walls like on the crazy fly. Um, and the first thing we want to define is that the hyperbus is 1.8 volt because the hyperbus has a differential clock. So it's a really sensitive interface. So we want to not have a um, level shifter in between. But this induces that also the UART going to the crazy fly is on 1.8 volts. The crazy fly needs three volts. So we'll put a tiny level shifter in between. On the way back, we actually don't need a level shifter because gap eight is able to handle um, free volts. So we are fine with just receiving the free volts signal. Then we have the camera. The camera, we can set the voltage domain to be 2.8 volts. That's fine. Um, but we also have one auto pin connected to the camera. That's a clock pin. So you can configure your camera a bit more specific if you use this clock pin as well. But this is in the same voltage domain as the hyperbus. So it's only on 1.8 volts. So we have a voltage uh, level shifter to 2.8 volts there. And now to the SPI. There we have a little bit of confusing detail. The SPIM underscore VDDIO voltage domain does actually not include our SPI bus because we are using the SPIM one and not zero. And this is multiplexed with pins um, that are in the camera voltage domain. So this SPI is on 2.8 volts from the gap side and 3.0 volts from the Nina side. This is close enough that they are compatible. So this is fine. And then finally, the Nina and the crazy fly are totally fine with each other because they're both on 3.0 volts. Good, now to the hardware. Still the same reasons why you need to know it. Here you can really measure it. So if something does not work properly, you want to first measure the voltages. There are some you can easily access, like you can measure the battery voltage on the expansion header. You can 
measure the internal voltage from gap eight on the huge inductor that you see in close to the camera. You can configure this voltage in software between 0 0.9 and 1.2 volts. You can also easily measure the 1.8 volts and the 2.8 volts at the inductors from the voltage regulators. Then you see the gap eight is really central on the board and has a LED on the left side. That's more for information where you find what. The gap eight has some memory connected. Then we have the Nina module um, that you can, with a LED also next to it. And you see the debug adapters as well to program gap eight and Nina. And now we also have some buses that you can snoop as I said before. So you have the UART buses, very easily accessible on the expansion headers. And also a bus you can easily access is the I2C going to the camera, you know, to control the camera. Hopefully you won't need it, but you could easily measure it on the pull-up resistors on the back side of the board. Um, one small note, we noticed that some decks have soldering issues that lead to 2.4 volts instead of 1.8 volt at the um, top left voltage regulator. So this is only used for the memory chip and it's inside the absolute maximum, but not inside the recommended operating conditions. So we did not notice any issues yet, but maybe if you have issues there, you can resolder the regulator. Now, how do we program this really special chip. So you see, so the archi architecture also already before with the eight cores in the cluster and one fabric controller, restricted memory, special architecture, we need specific tools. So we need the GAP SDK. Man Manuela briefly introduced it before. The GAP SDK um, provides us with the GAP 8 RISC-5 new tool chain. This, you can use it to program and control GAP 8. Um, you can use GDB to debug your chip. And you can use it also to program the external hyperflash through GAP8 with the GAP SDK. Also, it provides you a virtual platform so you can test your chip without even having a, you can test code without even having a chip or in a better testable environment. Also, the GAP SDK provides you operating systems. So you have PALBOS and FreeRTOS you can choose from, and they are building on top of um, the PMSYS drivers. So you have the PMSYS API driver for more low level drivers and the PMSYS DSP on top of the PMSYS API drivers. And the operating systems can then work on top of the PMSYS DSP drivers. So as a short example, if you want to queue a buffer that then receives camera samples in the PMC's DSP, you um, can use the Pi camera capture async function. And this then uses the functions from the underlying layer, the PMC's API, the API CPI capture async, that's for using the CPI is the camera parallel interface. So that can not only be used for um, exactly this camera function. And then your operating system is on top. You can define a callback task for this asynchronous function. And this is then a task from your operating system, either PulpOS or FreeRTOS. And the information for all this, you can find it online. There's a Doxygen documentation. Um, so you can look for all the functions of the PMZs API and PMZs DSP. You can search for functions in the top right. Be a bit careful because if you search for something in the PMC's DSP that's in the PMC's API, you won't find it. So you need to search in the right tab. I have here the links for you to the GAP SDK and to the documentation. And you'll see later on in the hands-on how to use this function in action. Thanks a lot for your attention. Go ahead. Okay, um, so now we do the hands-on session.
actually, in my hands on session, it's more walking you through the code. We don't have that much time, so we'll see what the code does. But you can try to do it at the same time. But if you don't have time, I think you, you get the slides afterwards, you get the recording, you can just repeat it afterwards. Um, so in this example, it's um, just about the basics. How do you program GAP8 for the first time? How do you connect the JTAG? And you're just doing hello world. So you need to connect your cable to the drone. You see the red line is where pin one is. And there's a small one on the PCB, actually. But it's really close to the 10 from the um, extension header from the crazy fly. So be careful which way you plug it in. You won't break anything if you plug it in the other way. but um, it won't work either. So red cable on the other side than Nina. Um, then you need to open a terminal and go to your GAPSDK home directory. So if you're on the virtual machine, you're all set then. If not, you need to source the AI deck um, .sh file that's in the configs directory. And then you can go to the examples PMC's Hello World example. You connect the JTAG. You keep to need to power on your drone. This will automatically power on the AI deck. We saw before the battery pin is on the extension headers, and that already powers your AI deck. And then you can compile and run. If you have a native install, you do this with make clean all run. Then you can define your platform with platform equals GBSoc or board. If you don't write anything, it will automatically board. So if you're on the VM, you just type gap underscore run, and it will do make clean or run platform equals both. If you need other commands, you can define them using the bash RC script or just use Docker to execute them. Um, then you'll get some output that's here in the middle now. So you don't get only one hello world, because we have nine calls, and they all tell you hello world. Um, and so first, how this works. So if you do make run, you actually write your code into the L2 memory of the GAP8. This is volatile. So if you then power off your drone and power it on again, the code is lost. It's not in the memory anymore. You have to do make run again. You can also do make flash, and then you write it through the GAP8 chip into the flash memory. And then if you don't connect the JTAG and start up your drone, it will automatically boot from the flash memory. But right now, at the moment, if you just do make and then disconnect the JTAG, power off the drone, and power it on again, all the code will run. The code that's right now already in the flash. So don't be confused. <laughs> um, your code will disappear if you power off the drone if you don't do make flash. Um, now we'll walk through the Hello World example. So here you see the code, and you see we start on the right in the main with the PMC's kickoff. So when we start a program in the main, we are on the fabric controller, the green thing here. We are only on the fabric controller. Cluster is powered down and doesn't even need energy at the moment. Then we can look up what is PMC's kickoff actually doing in the documentation and references I showed you before. Um, so this kickoff is actually used to start your operating system. You can define the operating system also in, when you compile. So and here, um, so either FreeRTOS or Pulp OS is then setting up the system, prepares the event kernel, the interrupt um, things, and so on. And then you see we jump to Hello World. So we're still on the fabric controller. We go to the Hello World program. And the cluster ID there is, is just 32 per default, because we are not on the cluster. We are on the fabric controller. And we only have core 0, so we have cluster ID 32, core 0 printed. Then we go on. We do the pi cluster conf init call. This is just setting the cluster config to default values. Afterwards, we set the ID manually to zero, because the only entry here that we care about at the moment. Um, and then we open the cluster from this config. I open from conf. So 
Um, and then we, we start up the cluster. So it will be powered up. And this is a blocking call then. So it will not, um, not stop. You will not exit the call before your cluster is powered up. Um, and then as next, we, we configure the cluster, cluster task. It's quite easy here because we don't have any arguments we want to give to the task. So we say, OK, our task is called cluster delegate. And then we send this task to the cluster. This function here is also blocking. So this will not return until the task finished. So you cannot use it if you want to do something else on the fabric controller at the same time. But there exists also another version of this with async in the end that will allow you to, to work on while the function is, is um, executed on the cluster. So if, when we send this, we go to core zero on the cluster, actually. So core zero on the cluster is now in the cluster validate function. Not all cores yet, that's important. But then we have the fork command, and the fork command um, then can fork to as many cores as you define. We here use the PyCL cluster ng cores that just tells you how many cores are available in the system. So this will be eight. And this means all the eight cores will execute the cluster hello world program. They will all execute the same code. Um, and then we go to the cluster hello world with all the cores and Sorry, and there we, we get the core ID and cluster ID again and print hello world from every core. And then we finish, we return, 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 and we do PMC's exit without any errors and finish the program. Then also to run this, you also need a make file. Um, so this here is really simple. You only need to name it, so we name the test. You need to define the sources. So it's hello world.c is so your only source. And you need to add where your header files are to include them. We don't have any spe special headers to include, so it's empty. We also don't have compiler flags defined, uh, linker flags, or we are also not using custom linker script. But you could all add all this here. Of course, this is not the whole make file. So in the pulp, in the gap SDK, you're using a underlying make file there you see the pmc's rules.mk that does most for you but here you can define the, the things that you as user have to define yourself good um, then we can actually jump directly in the hands-on session two um, this is now about image acquisition and parallel image filter so we don't only want to use Gap8, but we also want to communicate with the camera. We will see here again the overview. So camera and Gap8 now. This example, you can find it in the AI deck examples and bit craze. Um, if you have a native install, you, you always need, in every new terminal, you need to source the config file, config AI deck, the sh file. And then you can go to the Gap8 image processing examples, simple kernel example, and compile and run the code again. And here you can actually configure some flags in the make file. I'll show you that first. So we have a demosaicing filter there that's used if you have an RGB camera. You will have a, um, every pixel will have a color assigned and to compute actually the color image from this you need to average the right pixels with each other to get the red green and blue image so you need to compute something with all the pixels and get an output so that's what we call a kernel so you apply the demo in kernel you can do this either on the fabric controller or on the cluster you can configure this in the make file what you want to test and for this tutorial, for having an, a bit easier um, filter that we apply, so kernel, we, we implemented an inverting kernel. So you see, it just inverts the image. So 
the most black gets the most white. And you can also run this in the fabric controller. Also. So now I first walk you through the execution flow using um, the demo cycling on the fabric controller as an example. So we are not going into the details of the um, demo cycling. We're just showing how to take an image and so on. And then I'll briefly show you how this with the parallelization works with the inverting kernel on the cluster. So the code you'll see now is not exactly what you have in the example. It's simplified a bit um, because there are so many possibilities with this four with two kernels and four places and two places to run. So I removed some if this. But there's nothing left out that needs to work. So before we actually start working through the code, just let's think about why we would prefer a grayscale camera. So how many QVGA images could you have on GAP8 at the same time in the internal memory? And if it matters if they are colored or gray. So the GAP8 L2 memory is only 512 kilobytes. If we look at this, um, the image size is 79 kilobytes. So it's really huge for such a restricted chip. And you see the L1 memory, that's faster than the L2. It's actually only 64 kilobytes. So that's even smaller than one image. So you cannot fit a single grayscale image into L1. You could fit six of them into L2 or two RGB images, but you don't only want to store images in L2 because you need space for other things, other variables. And also, very important, you need space for the code in L2. You're running from L2. So those 512 kilobytes are very, very valuable. That's why we usually use a grayscale camera here, the RGB one. And now to the code. So here you cannot see anything, but we'll go through step by step. So first, um, we have a lot of includes. We, we need to include the drivers. Then we need to include the image IO library. I'll get to why later. You see on the right in the make file, we are also including the source file for this. And we are also adding um, the header file path to the um, include directories. Then we want to include our own demo cycling function. That's a file. We also added process and we also add um, the directory we are in to the include directories. And then we define the acquisition size. We can set the camera to acquire images of different sizes. And you can define that in the make file. And then we are already defining some variables. And you see this pi underscore L2. Um, macro that actually tells a compiler to place this um, buffers into L2 memory. Good, so we have the first part. Then we start again with main and then the PMCs kick off, um, like we saw before, set up the OS and then jump to test camera. So now we have test camera, we do a bunch of prints and then we open the camera. You now see a lot of similarities to before when we opened the cluster. You're also first initializing the config with default, mem default values and then setting the camera conf format to um, manually to what we wanted, what we said if, they, if it's QVGA or if it's a square image. Um, and then we open the uh, camera with a blocking call as well. And we initialize it, so now it's the opened and initialized the camera. Good. Then we go on with the next block. The next block is just setting some camera registers to ensure that the mode is the one we want with the image orientation. It's actually strangely not, not always working, investigating this. And the QVGA mode, and then if we want to have an asynchronous capture or a synchronous capture. So if we always take one image or if we always have buffers and queued, then we can get the images continuously. So it's configuring the camera registers, and then we go on. And we need to reserve buffer space for image. So 
we allocate um, space for the image. And you see, for example, now if you want to store a colored image, you need three times the buffer size of a grayscale image. Allocate the buffers, and then we can actually go to really taking the image. So you see there are two versions implemented here, actually. You have the asynchronous capture. So we can already queue a buffer before we are starting the camera to then get the image into this buffer. Um, and there we can define a callback. So you see this handle transfer end will be called once the buffer is full, so once we, we got the image. You see this function is there on the left, and then it will just set one variable to one. And I'll use that later on. Then we can start the camera. And now if we do the asynchronous capture, we actually just have to wait for the capture to end. So we see we are waiting on this done variable, if it will finish, and this pi yield will block until some event happens. So it doesn't matter which event, but every time an event happens, um, it will return and then we'll check if, if it was the right event, so done is really one. And if yes, we'll continue we took our picture. If we don't um, want to do a asynchronous capture, we can also do a blocking capture with just I underscore camera underscore capture. Then it will just block. We cannot do any funny thing until the image is captured. Afterwards, we can close the camera and we can apply any kernel we want. Um, in this case, here it's demo mosaicing to the image. And afterwards, exactly, that's the demo mosaicing function is why we needed to include, include that in the beginning. Then we need to write the image to a file. So here we're actually using the, the JTAG cable you have with the Olimax debugger. You can write the file over this cable with OpenOCD file semi-hosting directly to your computer. So this will write the file into the directory. All your code is in as well. Um, and this function is why we needed to include the image input-output library. Good. So now we have explained all the code. And I want to give you one more insight. So Usually when you're flying, you don't want to only take one image. You will want to take images continuously in a loop. So for simplicity, we just show this briefly with the synchronous capture, because it's a bit easier. So if you would remove some code, if you would want to run this in a loop, we just need to move out the stop and close camera. And then you can have a while loop around the capture and the kernel and the writing if you want to. And then it will just go on, take images, and go on, go on. Um, and then, of course, if you're not writing the image, um, you want to have a, as high as possible throughput, right? Because the kernel you run that defines basically how, how many images, frames per second you can process. So you want to optimize your code. That brings me to the um, next slide, because now you have the universal pipeline for any, any kernel you want to run. So we, now we are not showing the, on the demo mosaicing example, but on the inverting example. Um, how do we improve the performance of this kernel call? So one important thing always on this chip is avoid float operations. You don't have a floating point unit, so it will take very long. It will take 10 to 100 times longer than the equivalent integer um, function. And the next point is you can parallelize your code. And there it's important. In theory, you can have a if core zero, we do this. If core one, we do something totally else. But this will completely um, destroy your instruction cache. So you should take care that all cores execute similar code on different data. So best is if, if all your cores do exactly the same instructions, just the memory locations at which they do it are different, because then they can exploit the architecture of the chip, ideally. 
So as an example, we have the inverting candle here on the right. Um, you see in the top, we have a struct. That's all the arguments we give it from the main function. Um, so we just have a pointer to all this, what we need. And then in the beginning, we are reading everything out of the struct. And then we are doing, we are computing for every core which elements this core should take care of. So you see on the left, we start with element zero and then we go on until the element per core minus one um, with core zero. So every core just has its own area. And every core then only computes in its own area. And then we are actually around 5.5 .5 times faster. So I measured at 50 megahertz on both fabric controller and cluster, then it does not take eight milliseconds, but only 1.5 milliseconds anymore. If you would want to speed it up even faster, you could vectorize it because all the, all the elements you're computing here are only eight bits long. So you can actually take four of them because they have 32 bits and compute them at once. So if you have fun, want to try something that would be Cool idea to make it faster. I am Vlad, and uh, I'm going to, to present you the hands on part three. So, basically, uh, so far you learned about uh, the AI deck <laughs> and about the Gap 8, and you already know that um, the Gap 8 chip has, um, has nine very uh, capable cores. And this offers you great uh, potential to run advanced um, artificial intelligence algorithms um, and uh, machine learning algorithms and so on. But the thing is, um, the drone, the STM32 on the drone, is in the end the one that is controlling the, the motors. And therefore, if you want to, <coughs> if you want to use the perception algorithms that you deck to control the motors, you need to interact somehow between the AI deck and the crazy fly. And this is the topic of, of this session, is how to communicate between the AI deck and the crazy fly, and how to develop your own application in, uh, in the crazy fly firmware. But now let's, um, let's go into some details about the crazy fly firmware. Um, this firmware that runs in the STM32 uh, on board the crazy fly, is open source, available uh, on GitHub as th at this link. It uses a real-time operating system called FreeRTOS, and it implements solutions for uh, state estimation, uh, control, logging, uh, planning of the trajectories, and so on. And furthermore, it also implements the sensor uh, drivers and the drivers uh, for the DEX. And now let's uh, just clarify what is a deck. A deck is simply um, a plugin PCB that is attached to the Crazy Fly, just as the AI deck. Um, and of course, a very interesting and important and relevant feature um, of the Crazy Fly firmware is that the user can extend it with new new features, new functionalities. But now let's have a look uh, on the on the structure of this firmware. So. <laughs> That's an overview on the root of the firmware. And here we can distinguish two important elements, which are the SRC folder, where all the source files of the firmware are stored. And there is the make file, which uh, simply orchestrates how these source files are compiled um, to generate the, the binary that is intended to be flashed in the, in the query supply. And now let's go just one level deeper in the folder and here we can highlight again three important folders one is the uh, the deck folders when you find the uh, software implementation that enables the drone to exchange data to exchange uh, data with the decks and then you have the drivers folder which <laughs> contains the basically the source files which fetch data from the sensors in order to feed this data, for instance, in the state estimator of the drone 
or dark dual controller and uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, the third folder that is the modules folder, which basically contains the implementation of the estimation algorithms, of the control algorithms, of the logger, uh, planner, and so on. And uh, now that we presented like how the like and where the source files are, let's talk uh, about how you can um, you, you can develop your your own application. And obviously, one solution for that would be to simply add your source files to the modules folder. Um, but this would not be the best practice because in this way, you would alter the structure of the firmware. And maybe you would also have to modify the firmware file, for instance, the, uh, the make file. And then you might run into some uh, merging conflicts when you want to update the software. And, uh, and so on. Therefore, it is desired to keep your, um, your own implementation outside the, the CrazyFly firmware. And this is, a feature, um, this is a feature provided by the application layer, which basically allows you to, to achieve this. And um, you can simply write your own application, which is uh, outside the firmware directory, but which communicates with the firmware. And the firmware within your application will be simply integrated as a new task, which will be executed by the scheduler um, of the main firmware. And now let's see how you can develop. Such and I propose to start with an example uh, because the Crazyfy firmware provides uh, examples of, um, of how to develop this application. It's basically the examples folder in the root of the firmware. And in this folder, we uh, find several examples, but I propose to start with have Hello World because it's the simplest one. And we can just like go here and you will see uh, the structure of the folder. And within this uh, project example, we can again see the make file. <laughs> and uh, this make file will be eventually appended to the uh, main make file of the firmware which will basically compile all the source files, uh, the files of the firmware and the files of this uh, application that you develop. And the source files uh, that you will, you, will, you will develop are found in the SRC uh, folder of, of this project. And for instance, um, if you go into this example in the firmware, you will find the hello world.c, uh, which, which is here. But of course, we uh, agreed before that it is important to keep this application outside the firmware directory. And therefore, what you can do is to simply <laughs> uh, copy paste this folder outside the, the CrazyFly firmware. So you can just see, for instance, this is my directory structure. You can see that the CrazyFly firmware and the app Hello World now, after I copied the folder outside, are at the same level. But after you do this, it is very important for your application to be aware where the main firmware is. And therefore, you have to go in the make file of your app Hello World. And in that make file, you need to point the path of the CrazyFly firmware. Just like how, how I did here, you see I, I slightly modified the, the make file a bit and I, I tell it uh, where, where the firmware is. OK. And now uh, we can, uh, let's just like say a few words about the CrazyFly client, which is a desktop application, which allows the user to interact with the CrazyFly via USB or via Crazy Radio. So in this client, you can simply um, use the top left tab to connect to your drone, select your drone and connect to it. And from this, you can monitor a wide range of parameters, for instance, the battery, the drone's attitude, and so on. And uh, the client provides um, a lot of uh, a lot of capabilities, a lot of features. I'm gonna just present the most important ones. For instance, you have the debug console, and whenever you call debug print in uh, in your uh, CrazyFly code, the um, argument of this function will be actually printed in uh, in this console. So you you, you can just uh, use it to print various parameters. Um, and of course, you have the plotter, for instance. Whenever you define a new log in your firmware, which we'll see how um, in a bit, 
uh, you, you could monitor the evolution in time of some variables using the plotter of the, of the crazy fly client. Okay, so now we saw how to develop a new application in the crazy fly, and we saw how to use the client to interact with the application. But let's go in a more uh, specialized example on how to communicate between the AI deck and the firmware, which is actually um, our goal. So <laughs> let's uh, have an overview on our system. We have, on one hand, we have the AI deck. Um, and then we have the Crazy Fly, which is uh, equipped with an STM32 microcontroller. And the AI deck communicates uh, via UART with, uh, with the STM32. And then there is also another communication between the drone, the STM, and the laptop, which is done via the, via the Crazy Radio uh, provided by, by Bitframes. So in our example, um, we will have the AI deck sending the value of the counter every half second. So basically every half second, the counter is incremented and its value is sent by UART uh, to the crazy fly. And then the crazy fly will receive this value and it will print it via the, uh, via the crazy radio, which will be visible in the console of the, of the client. And what is important um, in order to um, in order to offload the, the main core of the, uh, of the crazy fly, we uh, don't receive the data, the data packets with uh, uh, the involvement of the CPU, but we use DMA, which um, is, as you, as you probably just already know, it's a direct memory access. So it's a peripheral which uh, takes the data packet uh, when it's received from the AI deck and it will automatically put this data packet at a memory location without the involvement of the, of the processor. And therefore, later, the processor can just fetch the data from the memory location and uh, use it accordingly. So DMA is just a, a more efficient way of receiving data via UR. Okay, so let's uh, just see some, some code. So here, uh, before doing anything, uh, it is important that you initialize the UART and that you initialize the DMA and uh, you also enable the interrupt. So whenever a certain buffer was received, a certain packet, data packet was received, an interrupt will trigger and it will inform the, the main software that the data is available. And in the following, in the left, we have the code running in the AI deck and in the right, we have the code running on the crazy fly. So you could see the code in the AI deck is fairly simple. We have basically a loop. And in this loop, we uh, just send the character by UART and then wait half a second until we send the next one. And in the crazy fly, um, we basically have uh, an interrupt down here, which, um, which will be triggered whenever um, a packet of a certain length is received. So in our case, the buffer size is set to one, and therefore the interrupt will trigger whenever we receive one, uh, one element, one byte via UART. So whenever we receive one new byte, we basically just set a flag, which is the DMA flag, and the main loop, the while one, will continuously um, check if this flag is one. If it's one, it means that a new character is available. We set this flag back to zero, and then we print this character using the debug print function. Um, and of course, if you can see at the very bottom, we also have a group, which means that uh, we continuously log the value of this variable to the client so that we can keep track of the variable's history. And of course, in our loop, whenever uh, the DMA flag is set to one, we also load the, the variable of the counter into the log counter so that it can be sent to a draw. OK, and now let's see a hands-on demonstration. So I'm going to switch now the, the screen sharing. And I want to um, show you a video of the setup first. OK. So uh, again, in the left, the 
uh, we have the code for uh, for the AI deck, and here basically we set up the UART, and uh, then it's this loop which sends the character, and uh, yeah, this is basically the same code that you saw previously on the slides. <laughs> so what are we going to do now? Is to um, start the to, to, to run the, the code on the AI deck, and it will continuously like stream this this counter value. Which will be um, received by the by the crazy fly, and using the debug print function, it should be shown in the in the console. So we uh, we are already connected here. You can see it's connected to a drone, and we hit make run. And as as you can see, the the firmware is running in the in the AI deck. And every half second, a new counter value is received in the in the crazy black client. So basically, this is how you can uh, how you can achieve a very very fast and uh, effective uh, interaction between uh, between these two processing boards. Uh, of course, you'll have access to to these uh, code examples, and you can just extend these functionalities. Uh, you you can. Um, Extend these functionalities for your own application, but yes, this was the uh, the third part or the hands-on, and uh, I I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. This is the last part of the Big Craze hands-on session, session number four, and we will be uh, seeing this example about Wi-Fi image streaming with the AI deck. So the roadmap uh, is this one, we are uh, right here. And uh, first of all, I would like to show you a real uh, high level overview of what we are going to uh, do today. So this is the whole system of the drone that we are already familiar with. And today we will not take into consideration at all uh, the main control board uh, of the drone, but we will just use the AI deck. With this AI deck, we will be uh, acquiring uh, uh, an image with the camera, and we want to stream it uh, with the Wi-Fi connection to uh, our laptop. Just a quick remark, uh, we are not using in any way for this example, a DB Craze, Craze Radio uh, dongle to communicate because this dongle is used for just for Bluetooth connection, while we'll be uh, using the Wi-Fi connection of the AI deck. So uh, a quick overview of what we are going to expect from this hands-on session. Uh, first of all, the example, it's inside the BigCraze GitHub repository, and it's called Wi-Fi JPEG Streamer. And you can find the code by following this link, and you will have the slides after these uh, workshop to go through it. First of all, uh, we will create a Wi-Fi access point uh, with the NINA Wi-Fi module. Then we will uh, establish a point-to-point -point Wi-Fi connection between the laptop and the AI deck. Then we uh, want to acquire an image with the camera. We want to compress it in a JPEG format. And last, we want to transmit it with the Wi-Fi connection of uh, uh, the AI deck. I also have one bonus task for you. Uh, uh, we will see that it's possible to pre-process the images before sending them with the Wi-Fi connection. And uh, we will use one of the uh, filters that uh, Hannah introduced before in the previous uh, hands-on session. And we will invert the color uh, of the image. So let's start. Uh, I wanted to show you the, fl the flow for um, set up the uh, AI deck, uh, the, the whole setup that is required to do uh, Wi-Fi streaming. Most of the steps, we already saw them uh, because they're in common with the previous uh, sessions, but let's go through it. First of all, we need to set the core uh, clock frequency. Then we need to allocate uh, enough memory for the image. Then we move uh, uh, to the uh, opening of the camera. And uh, we can also set some camera registers. After these uh, um, two new steps uh, kicks in, 
uh, we, we will see in the code how to open the Wi-Fi connection. So this step uh, tells Nina to open the access point. And uh, we will also open what is called the streamer. And this uh, has a double functionality because uh, it, it sets the uh, Wi-Fi as a transmission channel. So we are saying to GAP8 uh, that we want to send uh, uh, information uh, through Nina uh, with the Wi-Fi. And it also starts uh, the JPEG encoder. So this is the, all the initial setup. After this, we will enter into uh, the main loop. This is the main loop for transmission and is uh, uh, composed of three phases. We acquire the image, we perform JPEG compression, and then uh, in the end, we transmit the image with the Wi-Fi. So let's not uh, waste any more time and let's uh, see uh, how it's done in the code. So I will start uh, uh, by seeing step-by-step step, uh, uh, all the initial setup that we just saw. So first of all, uh, in this example, into the main function, you will see uh, that the first call, uh, call function is uh, PI frequency set. And here we are setting the um, main GAP8 uh, core, the fabric controller. We are not setting the uh, frequency for the cluster because we are not using it uh, for this example. Afterwards, you can see uh, a configuration of a GPIO. Uh, we are configuring uh, the GPIO uh, attached to the LED uh, of the AI deck. So it's in integrated uh, into the board. And we will just use this LED to uh, blink while we uh, transmit. So we have a visual uh, feedback of it. Then we move to the second step. We allocate uh, the memory for the image in the QVGA format. So uh, this format is uh, 320 by 240 uh, pixels big. And we uh, use the L2 uh, memory to store the image because this is the only memory that is big enough uh, uh, for storing uh, an image this big. And it was already explained by Hannah before. Uh, I want to remark that in GAP8, you always uh, must specify the target memory for the malloc. So uh, here you, you can see that we are calling a special function that is called PMC's L2 malloc. So we are allocating in, in the L2 memory. Then we can move to the third step, uh, opening the camera. Uh, this is just uh, as we uh, saw uh, before. And we can specify the format be between QVGA and uh, double Q QVGA. And uh, with this function call uh, PI camera open, we are actually uh, performing the opening of the camera. Then finally, we can also uh, activate the auto exposure gain uh, with this function code that is a PI camera control. And, um, and then we can move on. Then we have a um, very quick step to set some camera registers. In this case, uh, we just want to rotate the image by 180 degrees because by default, uh, uh, the images are upside down on the camera, uh, on the IMAX camera. And then uh, we have the new uh, part of the setup. First, uh, we call this function open Wi-Fi, uh, which opens the Wi-Fi connection uh, of the Nina Wi-Fi onboard module. This uh, function loads the configuration of Nina. And if you want to change uh, this configuration, you go, you uh, have to go and uh, perform this make menu config in this folder in the Nina firmware. And here you will have this window uh, popping up. And here you can set all uh, the configuration uh, for the Wi Fi connection. Actually, it is also possible to uh, open an, instead of opening an access point as we will do in this uh, tutorial. You can also choose to connect uh, to an existing uh, Wi-Fi uh, network. But in this case, we are interested in uh, uh, a direct point-to-point uh, -point connection. So after this function call, uh, we will be able to see uh, these uh, big craze AI deck example SSID uh, on our uh, laptop. 
And so we can connect to it uh, by clicking on this uh, Wi-Fi connection, establishing a point-to-point -point, uh, uh, connection. Then we can move to the last step of the initial setup. Uh, we uh, open the streamer. And inside this function, uh, these are the actions that uh, are being done. And uh, uh, as I explained before, first uh, we select uh, the Wi-Fi as transmission channel. This is just doing some handshaking between uh, GAP8 and NINA. So we are telling to GAP8, you, you uh, must use NINA to transmit images. We can set uh, uh, the image format, uh, choosing between uh, JPEG or uh, RAW uh, format. If uh, we choose uh, uh, JPEG format, we enable the JPEG encoder, and therefore we will be able to compress a bit the images, uh, um, having a, a higher uh, throughput uh, in frame rate while transmitting, because the images are much lower in size. And then we can also um, set uh, the uh, number of uh, the channels for the image. I want to um, remind you that normally uh, grayscale images have just one channel, while RGB um, cameras have as three channels. But also the RGB sensor in the first uh, version of the AI deck has a buyer um, a sensor. So it still uses one channel. So in both cases, you just uh, have to set these to one. Then we perform the streamer open and uh, we are ready to go. So in these, all this code, we just performed some handshaking between GAP8 and the NINA Wi-Fi module. And we started the, G the JPEG encoder. After these, uh, in the main function, we have this function called uh, PI Camera Capture uh, Async, which is the first uh, image acquisition. And this uh, function call starts the main loop that we saw before. This main loop is based on uh, two functions. Uh, the first one is called the Streamer Handler, and it's in charge of uh, uh, the image acquisition because inside these you can see that we are calling this function pi camera capture async the second step is handled by the camera handler and this step uh, compress uh, the uh, images in a jpeg format and then uh, also uh, transmit them with the wi-fi connection it does the these uh, by calling this function frame streamer send async so why I say that this is a loop? Because you can see that the first uh, function has a callback on the camera handler. The camera handler is the second function here. So once the uh, execution is uh, ended on the first function, we give control, uh, we proceed with the execution of the second function. This second function, the camera handler, has a callback on the streamer handler. So you can see there is a continuous back and forth between these two functions. So once we start the transmission, we will transmit um, indefinitely uh, without uh, ever stopping. So uh, now I would like to put our hands on the code. And I want to show you uh, the code in action. So uh, let me open my virtual machine. I, I would like to uh, go through all the stages. So first of all, as uh, uh, Hannah was saying, we uh, must uh, source the GAP SDK. So we must go to uh, the GAP SDK folder, and we must source uh, the uh, AI deck. OK, so now we source the AI deck. We can go back to uh, our um, example. We have the uh, Wi-Fi JPEG streamer uh, folder, uh, which has the code for our example. And we can launch the uh, program by just uh, making uh, make clean all run. OK, so now um, the code has is executed. And you can see uh, here printed on the terminal 
all the initialization steps that we talked uh, about before, because we can see the memory uh, allocation. Uh, we open the camera here. We rotated the uh, image, open the Wi-Fi and the streamer, and then the transmission has been started. So to see the images, there is a Python script that we can launch uh, by doing Python viewer .pi. And by launching these, we can see uh, the image streamed. And here we have a beautiful peak from Bahamas Highland. And here, here I am. So we also found a way to show our face, even if the streaming is not working on Discord. So this is going in real time, as you can see. And you can so also see the frame rate for the image transmission on top here on the window. So, but let's not stop here. I also have uh, one other uh, thing to show you. So let's resume the uh, presentation. And I also want to manipulate a little bit the image before sending it. So we can see that something happened uh, while transmitting the images. So we can manipulate the image uh, by, and I will apply the same inverting kernel that uh, Hannah introduced before. This inverting function uh, inverts uh, uh, the colors of the image, in this case, just the black and white. And I will guide you uh, through the code to see the, minim the minimal uh, modifications that I had to do to implement this. So first of all, we need to define a new buffer as a global variable uh, for the uh, new buffer of the image. Inside the main um, program, uh, we must allocate uh, enough memory for another image, for the image that has the color inverted. And we still uh, allocate uh, the, um, the space in the L2 memory, as you can see from here, with this PMC's L2 uh, malloc function. After this, uh, we can keep uh, exactly the, the very same transmission loop that we saw before. But uh, uh, we need to man manipulate the image right before sending it, right? So let's analyze this code. We have the first function, the streamer handler, that is capturing the image. So uh, this is not right before sending the image, right? While this second function is actually in charge of uh, uh, sending the image with this function call uh, on, on the bottom, with this frame streamer send async. So we just need to call this inverting function right before this, like this. So right before the send async, we invert uh, the colors of the image. Another small modification you might notice is that now we are sending this uh, buffer of the inverted image, while before we just had this, uh, uh, the normal buffer of the uh, original image. And we are ready to go. We can actually already try uh, this code. And the, the behavior that we will experience is the, is the following one. We have the uh, AI deck connected with the laptop with uh, the Wi-Fi. If we don't activate this inverting function, uh, we just get normal uh, looking images. While if we activate this kernel, we will see inverted uh, uh, images in color. So let's go back uh, to the code and let's see these. I will open again my virtual machine. The code is still running, so we can stop it. I actually already prepared the code. So uh, I'm going uh, inside the folder where I have the uh, new code. And just like before, uh, we run the program by making makelino run. So now we can see the setup. OK, great. Just as before, we can see all the previous steps. We have one extra step here. We allocated both the memory for the image and the memory for uh, the inverted image. So we have uh, doubled the space. Now we can call uh, the exact same uh, viewer that we were using before, the same Python script. And let's see what's, what happens. Here we go. So right now, the image, as you can see, has inverted colors. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, and you can apply any filtering that you uh, want uh, to your images and just stream uh, stream them like this. So this actually concludes uh, my presentation. I really thank you for your attention, and I hope you found this interesting. And I give the uh, space uh, to Daniele to conclude uh, this uh, uh, workshop. Thanks, Lorenzo. Very, very nice uh, uh, overview of all uh, uh, hands-on sessions. And um, I think that uh, before just uh, uh, leaving to the, the closing uh, to, the, to, to Kimberly, I just want to highlight one point, uh, uh, a remark, that uh, all these um, slides um, and links uh, and uh, all useful information will be made available. We will upload them for all of you, the slides we just used, so you can take your time, go through the code, check uh, in details and have a better experience uh, in your uh, uh, spare time. Apart from that, I, I let me share last time, uh, the since we did not have the cameras uh, uh, available, uh, picture of the group. I want to thank you all, Lorenzo, Hannah, Vlad, and Manuele for very nice uh, um, work you did. Well done, guys, and thanks a bit, Grace and Kimberly. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Daniel and Lorenzo, Hannah, Vlad, and Manuel for such a great workshop. Uh, we had some kind of uh, technical difficulty, but we hope to uh, sort that all out. At least we have very nice recordings of the hands-on, so that will be very useful for everybody. And yes, yeah, we um, like also from Bitcrazy, we would like to thank. Uh, all the speakers for uh, helping out. And we also have a uh, present. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show it here because I'm not able to share the video, but uh, what we can actually, uh, we have a small present for you guys. Uh, first of all, we have a virtual award. So I just posted the link on, uh, on the tutorial chat that you can check out your uh, thank you award for speaking. And also for all the speakers, we can offer you the nice sweater that I was wearing today. We'll have a copy for you too. So Thanks. just share uh, uh, like whatever you, like if you want it and, and uh, send the size to me and we'll make sure to make one for you guys. And uh, so that you also can have your nice own Bitgrace sweater and they're very comfortable. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Very nice from you. Thanks. Yes. And uh, yeah, anybody that has questions, that I saw that uh, Gemeenerik had a, a couple of questions indeed. So like, just uh, uh, just ask them on the tutorial chat. We're probably going to turn off our sound here. So either the tutorial chat or Mozilla Hubs, both will do. Um, and thanks again for joining. Hope uh, until next time. Thanks. Thanks you all. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining.